Good morning. Here are your announcements for today. The next new members orientation will be on Saturday, December 16th from 9.15 to 10.15 here in the Family Life Center. This is the perfect opportunity to get your questions answered about Crossroad and what it means to be a partner. To register, scan the QR code or email new members at crossroadlife.com. On Sunday, December 10th at 2 p.m., we will have the next water baptism. If you are interested in being baptized, please call the admin office at 302-741-2455 for further information. Men, please join us this coming Saturday for the men's huddle at 9 a.m. Ladies, don't forget, December 9th, make plans to be here at Crossroad for the Women's Wellness Encounter with your hostess, Pastor Margo, with special guests, Esther Graham, Stephanie Pierce, Ida Kirkendall, and LaDonna Graham. See you on December 9th. That is all for today. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hey, Father, I thank you for being so God in my life. Hallelujah. To get me to this point in this place, Father God. I, I know I've thanked you for so many tangible things, so many possessions, Lord, but I just want to thank you for who you are in my life. Hallelujah. I want to thank you for coming through the last time and the time before that and the time before that and the time before that. Has anybody got that testimony? Hallelujah. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine, he's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time, born of his spirit, washed in his blood, and what he did for me. in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail, he will never fail.
your turn. And everything I survived 
Shout hallelujah. <laughs> it's good for us to be here. Give God a praise. Thank you, Lord. Of all the things that I'm thankful for this Thanksgiving weekend is I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for you being in our life and us being in your life and us going through the journey together in good times and bad times, perplexing times, uncertain times, but they're all blessed times because of Jesus Christ. How many believe that? Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God bless you all. Uh, you may be seated. So we're going to be, uh, i make a couple comments. We're going to be in the Word of the Lord, 2 Chronicles um, chapter 15. I've asked you, we've been here for a couple of weeks Last week, uh, the Holy Spirit took a little turn, and we always want to be a church that's guided by the Holy Spirit. Many other plans, but it's God's purpose that shall be established. And so we thank you for your faithfulness from week to week and from generation to generation. I just want to make a comment about our um, liturgical dance team, if you want to call that, call it that, the worship team. I'm so grateful for them across the years. That family in particular <laughs> is, is gifted, in the, um, gifted in the dramatic arts, uh, and it's a blessing. Some people need a visual. And I just want us to unify around the bigness of our God, because there are people, and we're going to talk about this a little bit today, if not directly, indirectly, how that we can be splintered and fragmented because of our personal preferences. But we should be able to appreciate anyone and everyone's expression of a God that they know through salvation. Yes, that's it. Praise the Lord. Um, he's not a narrow God. Even all that he is to you is not all that he can be to you because you're still getting to know him. But I'm thankful for them in general, but specifically for the young men, the three young men um, that are active in, um, in that particular ministry. You know, um, it's a beautiful thing. It's an absolutely beautiful thing that young people would want to be involved and active in the house of the Lord, and we're grateful. And I just wanted to pause and give homage and give thanks. They practice hard. They practice a lot. And uh, we're never disappointed when they come before us. And indeed, their reputation for the anointing is all throughout our region. They are known, they are humble, their leader is humble, and that's the reason why God uses them to help people come into an atmosphere of worship and receptivity. And so I'm grateful for that once again. Um, are you ready for the word today? I'm checking. Some of you said that automatically. I just want you to check wherever you need to check and make sure. You can be seated, Beth. It'll be a minute before we get there. Um, are you ready to receive the word? I'll mention two things. I have a pastor that I, a new pastor that, that has accepted me as his pastor. Uh, he's in Virginia. And um, at this stage of our relationship, we talk just about every day. There are other pastors I don't speak to as often. I have some that 
uh, maybe 12 or 15 that were given to us by our beloved overseer. And then there are others that have come um, just organically. Um, and I don't need to see what it is that they see. I just know that it's a God that's orchestrating that. But the reason why I mention this particular pastor, we, we talk, we've been talking about a year. And in the course of that, uh, his spouse was uh, unceremoniously dismissed from her job. And after a long court fight, they pre prevailed with a, a decent settlement. They tried to ruin her reputation. That's a small town. Uh, but they are fully recovered and they're going forward. The reason why I mention his name is because when he and I converse, we're not face to face, but we're cheek to cheek on the phone, sometimes for 15 minutes, sometimes for an hour. But something transpires when we interact. And uh, I was saying to him the other day, we got, in, I don't know what the subject matter was, but we got to talking about some things. And man, I heard myself say something for his benefit that I've never said. Stories I've told. And it occurred to me once again that part of your ability to receive is your ability to prepare yourself. In other words, to show interest, to have anticipation of what God could possibly do given your circumstances. Some of you, you're in a season right now where we say, hey, it's all good. But if you're like most of us, there are plenty of areas where it's not so good, right? And so we've trained ourselves to put a smile, give praise anyway, but deep down, there are areas of concern uh, that we want to address. This particular pastor drains me in a good way so that when we finish talking, I'm not drained as in tired. I've poured out what God gave me for him, and so I'm refilled. Do you understand how that works? If you're to talk with someone about the Lord, you can talk about the game. We see our Eagles people representing up here. We just play. So, I don't, if, it, if you don't start none, it won't be none, right? Okay. So, so, so um, I find that I'm valuing that, that when people know how to place a demand on whatever it is you have, then that's the interaction. That's where we get that idea that iron sharpens iron and brightens the countenance of a friend. I don't think we talk enough. I don't think we share enough. We show enough gossip. We show enough got comp commentary about anything and everything, including areas where we have absolutely no knowledge, intelligence, or expertise. But we got a mouth, and we'll run it. So it's important to me, moving forward at the end of this year, just a, just a few days left in this year. And then next year, I'm in anticipation of what God is going to do in this particular house. I have such an anticipation. I have somewhat of a plan. Some of the plan is put together. All of it's not. But I know that God is in that plan. And as I yield myself to him and you yield yourself to him, God will take us into a space where we exactly need to be. Amen. So I'll begin with this. <clears throat> Recently, uh, when I travel, um, I used to drive my car, right, my personal vehicle or a company vehicle. And uh, in both cases, they're pretty old. <clears throat> but they're paid for, not prayed for. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> so, <laughs> man, uh, he blessed me with this car, and then six payments later, it's like, man, what happened? So... If I know Margot, she will do, undoubtedly, if we're on a road trip, she will do some shopping. <laughs> and we will end up mailing boxes back to UPS from wherever it is we are. And that's after I have leased a Yukon. <laughs> a Escal you know, something like, I'm talking about a large SUV. I mean, I like to ride. She likes the cargo space. <laughs> but to just bring you up to speed, the way the technology is now, um, I, I, uh, just all the gadgetry that's on it, you know what I mean? And one of the things that's on that is a lane departure warning system. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? You guys all have new cars, so you've probably been, you're like, Pastor, that's so old, what you gonna say about it? Well, 
I don't know where that's a blessing or a curse. It's not until you have a lane departure warning system until you actually realize how bad you drive. Right? And the way it's constructed, it's a safety device, but I'm like, look, I rented this car, and if I want to ride that line, then leave me alone. But how many of you have had the experience that your seat rumbles, and the wheel actually, you go on this way, and the wheel actually turns now, it, it'll let you go if you put your, your blinker on. That's what they say in Delaware. I never heard blinker until I got to Delaware. Your turn signal, okay? Uh, and then it will let you cross over. But absent that, you're saying, hey, look, this is where you're supposed to be to safely get from point A to point B. And if you slide, we don't know whether you sleep, whether you whatever, but if you slide this way, I'm going to be taking control. Who knows what I'm talking about? And for those of you who have never driven that, I'm sure you got a visual. Well, that, that's a warning device to help me know that I can be going off course. You have a smoke detector in your house to warn you of potential impending doom. It'll even warn you if the battery is low so you can come change me so I can keep giving you these warnings as necessary. You hope it never goes off, but in the times that it does go off and you don't know the word, whether it's real or false, you take heed to the warning that was given. Hmm. I'm grateful for warnings. Have you ever been on a mountaintop when the sign says, you know, running deer or falling rocks, and you're like, what am I doing on this road? And you swiftly get through there because you don't want to be the victim of whatever it is that's being warned. Well, there are warning signs in our culture. There are warning signs in our nation. And even Jesus gave prophetic warnings. He said, everything that you learn about me, you learn in the law, you learn in the Torah, um, you learn in the law, you learn in the Psalms, and you learn in the prophets. And so I want you to know that if we ever lived in a prophetic time, we, that time is now. I'm seeing across the landscape of ministry and kingdom all of these clues, all of these Reese's pieces, as in the movie of E.T., that are telling us, hinting to us, where we are in time, what's going on, what needs to transpire, and where we should be as God's people. I hear the first epistle of Peter, I believe it's chapter 2, verse 9, where he says, listen, I want you to know that you are a chosen generation. I'm not getting to my text just yet. Got a little bit of ringing back there. You are a chosen, help me, King James, chosen, right? Genos is the Greek word. You're a chosen generation. What else? You are a a royal priesthood. He's talking about you. In fact, I went back to check. Now, is Peter writing to Jewish people? Who is he writing to? He's writing to Jewish people, but he's also mainly writing to expatriates because of persecution that are in all these different places in um, parts of Europe and Middle East and so forth. He says, I want all of y'all to know that because of Jesus Christ, you are chosen. You are chosen specifically selected by God ahead of time. And if you recognize the clues, then you become mine. You are a chosen generation. You're a royal or a kingly. All of us watch, Marvel watches all these Hallmark deals and it, forever there's a priest, a princess, um, getting mar American princess marrying a foreign prince, you know. He says, you're royal. You're above. You're a royal priesthood. In fact, you have a sacerdotal function, and that means that you can offer sacrifice on behalf of another. We're not talking about Catholicism, but when you intercede, that's what a priest does. You can serve one another in the spirit of communion. That's what a priest does. You can be a bridge builder from one generation or what group of people to another. That's what a priest does. You are a chosen generation you're a royal priesthood. What else? You are a holy nation. Oftentimes we forget about the nature of the holiness that we possess. We possess the holiness of God by imputation, impartation. We cannot be holy in and of ourselves, but it's because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ that he sets us apart, forgets about those sins, and says, as long as you walk with me, I'll walk with you, and I'll set you aside. 
You remember years ago, I used the example of holy dishes. Those are the one in the hutch you use for special occasions. So to say that you are holy, there's nothing common about you. Nothing normal or cheap about you because God said you are a holy nation. And the last thing he says that you are a peculiar. I know for me it means that boy's strange. <laughs> He's really peculiar. But really what it means is that you are highly valued. The price that was paid for you and your salvation, no one else can pay. And there's no price that could be paid except Jesus Christ. He said, for those four principal reasons, you should always show out of your life a praise. Even when you're not singing the praise, show forth a praise to him who has called you. Do I have any believers in here who has called you? Ah, yeah. You called you out of, he called you out of darkness and, his, and into his marvelous light. So in that regard, you become a witness. You become a representative. You become an ambassador to all those around you wherever you go. I want you to get this in your mind. Don't let this evaporate because you got a whole VCR uh, um, um, full of movies that you got to catch up. Don't, don't, don't forget who you are. And it's on the basis of you recognizing who you are right now with this little exhortation that you'll be able to receive what I have to say to you for the remainder of our time together. Does that make sense? You are a chosen generation. Look at your neighbor and tell him you're chosen in your generation. Keep looking. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? <laughs> You're a royal priesthood. Tell them, you somebody special. Tell them, you a holy nation. Tell them, you a holy people. Tell them like Big Mama down south, you a holy peoples. A peculiar people unto God and you should show it. Tell them you should show it. Warning signs. A little over 20 years ago, and I mentioned this in our first segment, maybe like four weeks ago, that um, our nation was changed forever. I mentioned that the way you and I travel, particularly in the airport, but in a lot of other places, has been changed forever. We will never go back to the way that it used to be. And that's all because on one fateful morning, an American Airlines jet crashed into the, the Twin Towers. A few moments later, by the time the fire was coming out of the smoke of the first one, then we had heard about it and we was on TV on our devices watching the plane fly into the second one. I think there was something like 3,000 lives lost that day. I remember my prophetic friend, Evangelist Hargrove, he said, I saw this in mystery. I saw this. God showed me this, that we were crumbling and the nation had been attacked. So right now we're looking in hindsight. At the time it happened, we're trying to figure out what in the world is going on, right? I want you to know it wasn't just any attack. It was an unusual attack because we're living in unusual times. And I want to help somebody because when you stepped into the gates of this church today, you stepped into a dimension. It's not church as usual. It's not messaging as usual. It's what God would have for his people for such a time as this. And so if it takes you a while to, some meats have to be marinated. They got to be soaked. They got to they got to sit in it overnight. So, so I want you to help yourself by not dismissing yourself ahead of time. And the nation changed forever. People from across the sea came into this country. Now, understand, this isn't America. This isn't politics. This is the template from ancient times that shows where we would be and where we're going. 
If you really want to dig into it, you can actually find language in the scripture that talks about a bird descending from the sky and striking the land of consecration. If you really could dig into it, you'll hear about the tree that was removed and destroyed at the base of the church. If we really had time, we could go into the stone that they went and cut out of the mountains of New York to replace the Twin Towers to say, we're going to build it again. You'll hear about the three political figures in our current culture, one of them the president, that actually mouthed the words of the prophet Isaiah. In chapter 9, verse 10, a confession of defiance that we don't need God. Are you here? If your neighborhood is in trouble, then you're in trouble. If Crosstown is in trouble and your side of town is okay, I want you to know that you're in trouble. Understand, it's not unto devastation, but it is to understanding. So our lives change forever. That was one of the templates of this messaging that I want to take you through, and we'll just touch it lightly this morning. So the title of the series is A Template for Prophetic Messaging, a template for prophetic messaging. Let's review. A template, we said before, is a pattern. It's, a, it, it's something by which you can collate information into a usable form. It's a template, and I think we use the, one of the ideas would be guys in wood shop, you have a template where you can cut shelving out. You cut along that. It's a pattern. Uh, Jesus is that pattern. He's called the coping stone or the cornerstone. Historically in Israel, they cut every stone in the tabernacle from that one stone. Watch. They didn't make a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy because the little bit that each copy is off, by the time you get to the end of a building this big, the building's leaning because it's crooked. So you always got to cut from the original. Ladies that, that sew, you would know this, that you have to have a pattern and you have to cut according to the pattern. So God gives us prophetic messaging in the scriptures. Remember, it starts with the law. It goes into the prophets and then shows up in the Psalms. Jesus says, all this testifies of me. Well, if all that testifies of him, how come we don't know most of the stuff that's testified of? And so now, once again, 20 years later, I would not have you to be ignorant, brother, but let us examine what God is saying in this time for us, his people. It's a template for messaging. The messaging is the way God communicates. Hebrews chapter 1 says it this way. In time past, there were sundry ways that God spoke to us. And he spoke to us, he spoke to, look, our fathers, our spiritual fathers through the prophets, right? I'm going to give you a definition of, of prophecy or three, uh, three, three prongs of prophecy that God has showed me in the early outset. He says, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. So two things. He spoke to the fathers, our ancestors, spiritual ancestors, Abraham, all that through the prophets, that prophetic voice that speaks the mind of God about a particular thing, a particular place, a particular people for a particular purpose. What did he say? That prophetic word speaks the mind of God for a particular people, for a particular place, for a particular purpose, for a particular time. God is speaking to us out of the ancient pro prophetic uh, books. Prophecy. The prophetic messaging from then until now. Now, let me divide this up and share with you. It's going to help us before I re read our scripture. Hope you, you find your, your place in 2 Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 Chronicles. I say it every time. 2 Chronicles chapter 15. So, three kinds of prophecy that we're going to talk about. And I want you to let this go into your spirit. This here, right here, isn't an emotional message. This is a message of understanding because you and I have a part to play in the future outflow of what I'm going to share with you. So the first type of messaging that God gives us and what you're mostly familiar with, watch, is prophecy as prediction. 
So people know I'm not supposed to go to the crystal, crystal ball gazer or the palm reader, but I will go to a prophet and I'll beg a word of them. Do you have a word? There are whole conventions, there are whole activities in church built around the value of prophecy. But if the prophecy doesn't follow the template of what God has said, personal prophecies and all of that, there's a way to do that. There's a wrong way to do it and there's a right way to do it. So I'm just talking about prophecy as prediction. Call it predictive prophecy if you're taking notes. Predictive prophecy, and that's about the foretelling or the foretelling of future events. If you want to study on the side, then go to the book of Daniel when he spoke to us about the 70 weeks. That's a prophecy that was thousands of years ago and still has yet to come to pass. Part of it's come to pass, and all of it's about a coming kingdom, all of it's about the end of the age, and all of it's about our attitude moving forward. So predictive prophecy, Daniel's a good example. The second kind is instructive prophecy. Instructive prophecy. And right on the heels of us getting a word from somebody, they, hey, it's going to be all good, and in seven days money going to fall, and this and that and the other, and all that, all the kind of crazy stuff. And God is, has very little interest in that. Jesus said the main purpose of prophecy is to reveal me. I can't get no help. So how about we put all these crazy abracadabra, hocus pocus, witchcraft, manipulation, crazy, worldly, demonic, satanic ideologies and find out what God is really saying and find out what he's working. I don't care if you eight or you're 80. The spirit of the Lord is upon me and he's anointed me for this hour to give unto you what's on his mind. And in that way, you'll be prophetic. Glory to God. You are a prophetic and a peculiar people already. You just don't know who you are. That's the plague of the world right now. People don't know who they are, so I must be someone else. I don't know how he made me, so I must be someone else. And the someone else you're trying to be, you never were that person, so how could you know what it feels like to be that person? And so the prophetic word comes to the house of God. Because the house of God in the earth is the repository of God's truth. No one else has God's truth. That's why you're peculiar except God's people. No one else can offer prayers to the living God on behalf of the dying, crying, sighing calamity in humanity but the people of God. I don't want to know if you're anointed to speak a word. Are you anointed to pray a prayer? Are you anointed to love the unlovable, are you anointed to forgive? <laughs> Ministry gifts are a dime a dozen, everybody trying to be a big shot. But God says, listen, I want you, Wallace, as it was now, I want it to be then. Or then, let it be now. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. I don't need you to come up here. I need you to get down, get down, get down on your knees, get down on your face, get down on your attitude, reduce yourself, and I will increase myself in you. The world is at stake. Humanity hangs in the balance, and yet we use playthings, messing around with things that should be of eternal consequence, not speaking up, not being counted, just letting it go by, calling ourselves, I'm waiting on the Lord, I'm waiting on the Lord. God says, you've been waiting on me the last 20 years, I'm waiting on you now, what it's going to be, bro. I, I, I feel this in my spirit. God says to many of you, fear not. God says, don't worry about what you're going to say. But if you show up in the moment and you consult with your inward man, I'll give you what to say and they won't cancel you. Oh, Gloria, I heard somebody, somebody, they won't cancel you on your job. Pharaoh will bring you close. Are you hearing me? Cyrus will bring you close because they heard something anointed by God that they're not hearing from the magicians that serve them, from the masters that serve them from the staff that served them. They're not hearing truth, but God has set it up for them to hear truth from a beacon of light called you. 
And when you speak up, God will make a way because God will break his own way and the glory of the Lord shall fill the whole earth. I need somebody to get excited. Do you know who you are? Do you know what you're here for? Man, this thing is real. So God gives us warning signs. Before I take my text, before I read my text, I'm not going to ask you what kind of world you live in. I think you already know. What kind of world are you observing? God says to you and me, hey, are we going to do something about that? Are we going to do something about that? You're saved and sanctified, and the questions out of culture come to you. Hey, is there even a God? And if we're not rooted, we're not grounded. They take your Bible out your hand, show you a scripture. Now you're confused. Because we've relied on the preacher. We've relied on the vocal big shot icon. But all of us, you're just as anointed as the next person. You're just, see, if you get thirsty, you're not going to give them a glass of water. If you get thirsty, you got to pick up your own and drink it down. God's saying, what are we going to do about this? Because without you, I have no voice. Without you, I have no one to speak God's truth to power. Not truth to power. Not your truth to power but God's truth to all the powers that ever could be. So let's read this. Second Chronicles chapter 15, this is from the Amplified. And I chose this because it was a, you can stand if you want, I, I don't, it won't bother me if you sit. But I, I'm like, God, why did I land on this scripture? Then I'm going to tell you why. Remember, Jesus says the first prophecy we receive about Jesus coming is in Genesis, the beginning of the book. And that prophecy, that, that scarlet thread continues all the way through these dispensations until the very end. So we are living out the prophetic utterance of the fathers that he spoke to by the prophets and then by the prophet that he sent in the person of Jesus Christ. This particular passage is a good jumping off place. You have the chronicles of the kings and the rulerships in Israel and in, Ju and, and in Judah, um, the United Kingdom, the divided kingdom, and they all repeat themselves. That's why I say it's a template. Watch. <coughs> have you ever felt like A.R. Bernard calls it cycles of temptation. You get free, you're tempted by the same thing. You get victory, you fall back into the same thing. So that becomes a satanic template for the enemy to use against your progress. Is it making sense? But if you don't make a change, if you don't do anything different, that cycle will continue and it'll be a cycle of a downward spiral to depression and regression. So God says, I want to come and make it plain to my house where we are so that you can think. Remember, repent is about thinking, not about feeling. Repentance is about changing your mind, not your wardrobe. So God gives us this snapshot. Here's what he says. He says in verse um, 5, In those days, in tho there, those times, there was no peace for him who went out, for him who came in, for great suffering came on all the inhabitants of the lands. Nation, say nation. Nation, nation was crushed by nation, say nation. 
city was crushed by city. I'm going to go further. Families were crushed by families. Ethnic groups were crushed by ethnic groups. Political parties were crushed by political parties. Churches crushed by churches. Christians crushed by other Christians. <laughs> and it says, great suffering came upon all the inhabitants of the land. Unless you look to the Lord, you see trouble everywhere. Can I say it? Trust me when I tell you, this is not a negative message. It's just what it is. And then he goes up and says, here's what happened. Verse 3. It's because for a long time Israel, Zion, the people of God. This isn't Washington. This isn't Dover. This is the house of God in type. The house of God was without the true God, without a teaching priest, and without God's standard of righteousness. And then it says, when they turned, or when they were in the worst part of their trouble, listen, and distress, they turned unto the Lord in desperation, sought him, and he found them. You may be seated. I can see to you that if you are the salt of the earth, and the light of the world, then we probably have problems. Because we ain't been real salty. And we ain't been real bright. You know what we've been about? Hey, I got to get mine. I'm blessed. Here's the stingy nature of Christian immaturity. I got to get mine. Watch. And here's how you accuse your brother. If your brother not doing like that, you think, you think, I'm calling the devil out on the spirit. You think that your, that your discipleship with God is somehow superior to them. Remember, I preached several weeks, I preached several weeks ago. Remember the man born blind? Right? And the question came, who sinned? See, that's what you want to know when you think you doing good and they doing bad. Brother must be something. Brother, you know, are you making your confession? Brother, are you doing your tithe? Brother, are you, see what I mean? Who sinned, this man or his parents? Jesus said, neither. How about we lose the sin consciousness? How about we care about humanity? How about we share the love of God? How about we don't judge people the first time you meet them based on where you think you came from? God said, I have an indictment with the house of God because you didn't maintain the priesthood. You didn't maintain the true God. You took the God of the house and turned it into a God in your house. And some of you, I dare to say, in your house, you have all the trinkets of this religion, all the trinkets of that religion, a hybrid from that. And then if that's not good enough for you to worship, you go outside and you wax in your car every week because that's your idol. Your job's your idol. Your degree's your idol. Your own ideology is your idol. And I came to sound a trumpet in Zion and to lift up my voice and show the house of Jacob their transgressions. All of us together, all of us together, we quote, if, if, if we humble ourselves and pray. We praying, but we haven't humbled ourselves. God, I'm nothing without you. I'm nothing without you. You're everything, and every time I consider who you are, what kind of love is this that you should love me and care for me and come for me and comfort me and uphold me? And I got the nerve to walk around with a chip on my shoulder, holier than thou, so heavenly minded, no earthly good. 
God said, it's time to get down, go down, fall down, come down off your high horse. There's only one high and mighty, and his name is Jehovah God Almighty. I know I have some saints in here. You might as well give him glory. Jesus said, if you don't, I'll bring a rock off the street. Get him to grow lips, and he'll give me praise in your place. Somebody, if he's done anything for you, you need to give God praise. You was on the brink of suicide, losing your mind. And God picked you up. God brushed you off. God gave you a chance. God put favor in someone's heart for you. And how dare we ration our praise like government chiefs. He's the almighty God. He's the God of my salvation. He's the Lord of my life. I will not serve no other God. Go back to verse 6. Nation was crushed by nation. Do you see it? This is an ancient prophetic mystery. Out of Israel, that's the type of the church. I realize now to mention Israel in a church that looks like this is risky. Because it's a risk that I'm going to take. Because Watch, we let the culture around dictate to the kingdom within, and you can walk away thinking you're wrong because some Ph.D. told you that. If you believe your Bible at all, God speaks to a man in Mesopotamia in a paganistic, multi-theistic, idolatrous culture by his sovereign will because God's so good. Sovereign, we think of sovereign as God, and that's right when it's capitalized, but when it's not capitalized, sovereign simply means above. So you have a sovereign like your boss, he would be sovereign, or a head of your family, your elder statesman, matriarch, that's sovereign. So it's anything that's above. That's why everything that idolatry says should be lifted up equal to or above Jehovah God needs to come down. Everything. My idea. My feeling. My history. My, I don't know who I'm helping. Um, My pain. You don't know like I know. And I may not know like you know, but I know somebody that do know. He know all about it. He know more about it than you do. But if I lift that up as reason and a rationale, I lift it high so that I can live low, then God's not pleased. He says, the latter part of verse 6, he said it happened because God troubled them with every kind of distress. You notice something in our culture, in your family? Do you have those people that no matter what happened, Trina, it's not their fault? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do nothing. It was not my fault, right? And so if it's not my fault and there's something wrong, there has to be fault laid somewhere. I just want you to know it wasn't me. (laughs) Funny, that's what everybody thinks. Because you love yourself. Not only do you love yourself, you in love with yourself and your idea. Some, it's a defense mechanism. For others, it's a prideful proclamation of who you think you are based on how God sees you. God sees you that way, but I may not see you that way. I'm certain you don't see me that way. Am I dealing with some issues today? Listen, this is the scalpel. This is the scalpel of the Holy Ghost based on God's word 
to put you to sleep, as it were, put your flesh to sleep, wake you up in the spirit. Elder Wayne talked about it a couple years ago, a, a couple weeks ago, how to make your spirit strong. Put all that stuff out of your mind. Be baptized in your mind. And then let God speak to you about the proper order of things based on his word. Is it making sense? Otherwise, we're nothing more than a conglomeration of all the ideas and all the experiences. We are, you know who our God is? Our God is poly. Poly, poly means many. No, oh, that's your, just your opinion. Do you realize that every argument and every discussion, every, and I'll use this word politics, because I was, I was looking at this, politics and when I say politics, please do not think about legislative offices that we about to vote. vote. That, that's part of it. That's what we see. But do you realize if you're at, if you're at dinner, or like Margaret and I, we were planning this Thanksgiving dinner with her sister, with her sister, my sister-in-law, and so they started having a meeting about, hey, where's it going to be, right? Who are we going to invite? What we going to have? And one says, well, I want dumplings. I don't like dumplings. The other says, well, I want broccoli and cheese. I don't like broccoli and cheese. Right? Well, somebody like it. Should we do it for the people that like it? No, I'm just saying I don't like it. Do you know what's happening? According to the biblical definition, that is a political meeting. Politics is about when any group of people get together, especially people that are dissimilar, they have to discuss how is it that we're going to conduct business with sanity and unity. So now, like for example, I know here historically people would say, here's a political church, here's a political preacher. And they say, this is what they say when I start talking to them, fully you experience this offline. And so we start asking questions. Because we, this is the water I swim in, right? Just me personally. I swim in this, not asking you to, but I'm anointed for this. I said I'm anointed for it. I'm anointed for it, and if I have time, I'm going to show you why you should care. So watch this. People say, I don't want to hear that, man. I don't get into politics like that. How about I go around the corner, and I hear you giving your political opinion on what you said you couldn't talk to me about. I'm just trying to get us all to look in the mirror that you allow for you what you don't allow for me. Your selfishness allows for you what you will not, cannot, do not allow for other people. And God says, listen, what am I going to do with y'all? It's winding up. Jesus at the door. Very few things have to happen now. And we should be out and busy representing, showing forth the praises of him who have called us out of darkness, set us into a kingdom so that his will can be advanced in the earth. Do you know it's God's will for everyone to be saved? Do you know, can I mess with you? Everybody in the KKK, it's God's will for them to be saved. Some of them think they saved. It's God's will for Donald Trump to be saved, for Barack to be saved, Bozo the clown. But we get triggered by these terms, and then we turn off our, our ears instead of discerning that we should be balanced as believers. We should be balanced. The person you hate with all your guts, God loves with all his heart. And so if God loves them, then you're, you're commanded to love them. You're commanded to love them. You don't get to preach in the church and have a position and come tell me who you hate by how much. That's unrighteous. The Bible says all unrighteousness is sin before God. I'm not sinning before God. I just can't deal with them. No, that's trespass, the second dimension of your sin. And that's you cutting across, trespassing on someone else who's made in the image of God but may not know it. God said, can I use you to represent me? Can I use you to give them my idea about what I think about them? Not their behavior, what I think about them. If I died for you, then I died for them. It wasn't all that long ago, mom and daddy was picking cotton. Chopping tobacco, I don't know what you do. Do you chop tobacco? Or you pick? 
Y'all get my point, what I'm trying to say. Right? Not all that long ago. I've had to tell people that come with the black thing. I'm like, look, man, in a couple of years, I'd be 70 years old. That means I've been black for, for seven decades. But here you coming with the new definition of what black need to be. Could we sit down and talk? Do you see nation is crushing that? Uh, this person is crushing that person. And because we're afraid the love of God can't shine through, I'm going to suggest to you today before the service is over, come and get a refill. Come and get a reconnect. Come and get what Archie Bell and the Drell said. Come get a tighten up. Can you tighten up on your love game? Can you tighten up on your wisdom game? Can you tighten up on your maturity thing? Or will we be like little children picking? He started it. They did it. So and so, 16, 19, 16, 20. Did it, did it, did it, did it, did it, did it. God said, can we please stop? You say, well, why are you talking to me, Pastor? I already explained to you it wasn't my fault. Let's assume that it wasn't your fault. The fact that it is, is someone's fault, they'll remain unidentified, but it's not about whose fault it is, it's about whose fix it is. Is there any fix in you? You know, according to the mighty power that works in me, according to the greater is he. Greater is he, but is he greater than it? Is he greater than that? I digress. Predictive prophecies, one. Instructive prophecies, that's telling us what to do or telling us what we should do. And those are great. But really what those should be is confirmation. Not somebody come told me to do it, now I do it. There should have been a witness in my heart, click. That what they said was confirming what God was already showing me. And then the last one, what we're dealing with here, is this observational analytical prophecy. Let's see. So, where this thing really started messing me up, Bumble, was I kept hearing this thing, nation. Remember, he tells Abram, um, get away. This is a good idea for somebody. <laughs> get away from your family, in-laws and outlaws, and go into a land that I will show you. He didn't even tell him. He says, can you just start walking with me? I hope somebody's hearing something. I don't believe God is asking everyone to pick up, pack your bags, and physically move. Like he moved me, Genesis 12, he moved me out of Delaware through the vehicle of the army. And he spoke out of this chapter personally, and the promise wasn't to me or for me initially. It's to Abraham, or Abram at that time. He says, but here's the pattern. Here's, are you hearing it? Here's the template. Here's the map. Here's the GPS. Get out of the norm and go to a place or a dimension or a place of thinking that I will show you, and there, there. So it can't be here. It can't be where you currently are thinking. He says, it's in that dimension when you are away from all your normal historical distractions that I will speak to you, I will direct you, I will guide you with my eye. He says, I will bless you, right? And in you shall all nations, ye are royal generation, a holy priesthood, a holy nation. He says, I'm talking about nations. Can we please get out your house and your family and your neighborhood and your little echo chamber? God is speaking to the nation. The nations are comprised of tribes, and those tribes are comprised of families, and those families are comprised of members or people. Are you hearing this? He tells him in verse 1, he says, you're going to be a great nation, right? 
And all nations of the earth will be blessed because of this arrangement that I have with you. I want you to start seeing Palestine and Israel through this lens. So this was about 4,000 years ago because we were arguing about who was there first. God makes a sovereign choice of a man, displaces him and his family, takes him to another dimension so he can talk to him. And if you can understand what he's saying, it's through this man and his obedience that Jesus Christ, your Savior, comes. I mean, I ought to be home field advantage because he was Jewish. <laughs> you know Jesus is Jewish, right? Boy, it's so quiet. Are you learning anything or are you staring at me in disbelief? And it's not to pit the other one. Oh, if I had time, I would take you to Genesis chapter 17. Chapter 16 talks about the drama between Abram's wife. I'm talking about, see, trouble on every side when we won't do any. See, Abraham didn't believe God before he did believe God. And when he didn't believe God, he believed his wife that said, I don't believe my situation, so here's this girl. So go sleep with her. And now the family drama starts. In Genesis 16, if I don't get no further, I feel the spirit of the living God. I know some of us know this, but it's time to review this, or if they're going to pull you off your square while snatching the Bible out your hand and taking you out of a building you call church, we better get this down. It is warnings. It's warnings before destruction. That lane departure, it, it warns you before you leave the lane, because if you leave this lane, you may lose your life. If we're not on point, we may lose the land. We know the land is already going down. Any nation that forgets God, there's a promise in the ancient mysteries that you will go down. Oh, I wish I had time. I'm going to talk to you about Nineveh. Nineveh went down. Even after the preaching of, of Jonah, Nineveh went down. Egypt went down. Um, Babylonia went down. Assyria went down. Medo-Persia went down. Athens went down. Rome went down. Guess who's next? Guess who's next? He sends planes, and the thing you're going to do is, we're going to do this and that, and you ain't did nothing. It's just gotten worse. Can I draw your attention back to verse 6? He said, God troubled them. God troubled them. You think it was a plane out of the sky? No, it's a God out of the heavens. It's a God out of the heavens. I said it's a true God out of the heavens. I, I, I just wish, I wish, I wish I had time. I, I'm making this appeal because I have three kinds of people sitting in this congregation. Some of you just biding your time. You'll say, I ain't never coming back to this church again. A reve. Jerky. <laughs> to your own peril. To your own detriment. Because here's what we do. I want to find a preacher that's preaching what I think they should be preaching. You don't go to the church of your choice. You go to the church that God sovereignly choose for you. That's the problem now. He can't get you to agree with his plan because you got your plan. God, by definition, is going to make you extremely uncomfortable in your development as a believer. It's going to be, you're going to get cut. That's what circumcision is about. He got to cut away the excess, cut away the nonsense, cut away what Bishop said is superfluous. Superfluous is just a fancy word. That's all extra. And you always accuse each other of having extra. God said, come with me and I'm going to cut it away. The sign of the covenant. God troubled them on every side. I'm afraid that this nation and so many like it don't know this. <laughs> Who was that congressman? J John Lewis. Remember, he's, he's we were in the airport in, um, where were we? Atlanta right, where he did a lot of that marching, and they have this constantly playing thing. He's there. He was a lawyer. You know, he's iconic in the civil rights, and he was given that thing about, I got in trouble. I got arrested. He said, but it's good trouble. And a lot of us 
folk that look like me, we done picked up on that tag, but we don't know what it costs. We can make the quote, but we can't walk that walk. We're going to spout off about what that walk gave to me in terms of my rights, but you disrespect the grave of that person. I'm not talking about good trouble. I'm talking about God trouble. I just want to remind you again, as I did on that first day, if this is God trouble, planes flying into buildings, our way of life changed forever. Absence of planes flying into buildings, the federal building was cracked at the foundation in New York City, signifying in ancient typology that your government is through. Walk down the street to the church, saint, I forget who it is, the church, the tree is gone, the church, not even a broken glass. Couple blocks down. And we put our faith and trust in human government, earthly government that gets no heavenly instruction. I'm here to, I'm here to cry loud. I got some legislators I'm planning on seeing. Some of you I've talked on a pro. I want to know who you are because you come here asking for my vote and my support. But I'm neither right nor left. That angel showed up. Joshua said, whose side you on? That angel said, I own nobody's side. I come to take this whole thing over. That's a picture of the kingdom. And because this kingdom is so out of whack, that's why there's no place for the king. He can't be born in the palace. He has to be born in the manger. He can't be born in institutional religion. He has to be born in your heart. And it's from your heart that he begin to change your whole life. And it is a process. God got to put up with you. The devil got to put up with you and your new identity. And best of all, you get to put up with you. Can I digress? Steve Harvey was at MegaFest years ago in Atlanta. And y'all remember this. He said his, this, his content was called uh, Don't Trip. God ain't through with me with the T.D. Jakes, right? So I know all of us holier than thou folks said, what are you doing here? I did. And they got the comedy thing going on over there, and they got the choir over here, and they got the study over here, and they got sightseeing over here. And I said, we said in our little group, we ain't going to hear him. Y'all remember? How many of y'all remember Steve Harvey's thing? Google it and go back. His thing was called, Don't Trip, God Ain't Through With Me. Steve Harvey had become a new believer, right? Jake's, the princely father in the faith that he is, understood there's no way he can be where I am after 30 years of dedication serving the Lord, and I still miss it. But what he is is he's on his way. And Steve was trying to say, he says, I know y'all don't think I know the man, but I know the man. But he's just working with me. I know the man. I know what's going on. But he's working with me, walking with me. And he gave the, and then at the end, he gave an introduction to Jesus Christ. Like, he, he said, I'm going to call Jesus Christ to the stand. And man, I'm telling you, I couldn't have done that good as a Holy Ghost filled and fire baptized preacher. See, we're judging God said, let the judgment begin at the house. We're wrong. We won't apologize. Holding grudges, gripes for years. The girl you couldn't stay away from that you finally married, now you can't be next to. It's unrighteous. I said, it's unrighteous. We received the die. Oh, it's complex and it's complicated. You seeing one guy and this guy over here talk about and we members in a church in a denomination and everybody know that every, every time somebody gets caught uh, I don't know what I was thinking well I know what you're thinking now <laughs> right and look we can laugh don't laugh too hard because that's been me can I get can I get a support group that's been me holding grudges that's been me cussing folk out in my mind. That's been me dreaming about beating them down in the middle. Can, I, I thought you want some help. I thought you wanted to get some of this weight up off of you. Because you bearing a weight your shoulders were never built to carry. That's somebody else's stuff. 
That's stuff that the devil loaded on you. And now you're captured and you can't get free. Come on, lift up your hands and shout his name. Uh, if God give me, che- and I'm checking myself, Trina, I'm checking, because this is what I want to do. Because I want to look a representative in the state. Uh, I mean, here's why you should care about political culture, okay? If nothing else, I don't care nothing about your political beliefs. Just make sure that somebody's not feeding you a line of, B.S. Bloney sandwich. See, you was thinking something else. <laughs> right? <laughs> They're like, <laughs> I don't know what's the problem. You said worse yesterday <laughs> or this morning on your way to church with your husband. Did God climb all the way in? I'm saying, God, I'm desperate. God, I'm a hot mess. You've got to help me. So I don't hurt me. Help me, Lord. Help me. Take me through this day. Oh, my God. I trust in God, my Savior. That's what we said. If God is the cause of the trouble, then why do you think the White House can help you? They in trouble been in trouble. Governor, they can't help you. We can plan it now. The boy got beat down in the street on New Street. I was there with all the reverends. We do what we always do. Ain't nothing happened. What you think is going to happen? And you think voting for a particular party is going to give you what you're looking for. The party done left God a long time ago. The party's introducing all kind of craziness that you just go like that because you think you're going to get some kind of civil right reparation business out of that. They said that mess in California. Can I just talk reparations? One million. I'm like, they in debt. They're a deficit. And you got to figure out at some point whether they black, white, red, blue, green, or polka dot. They're lying. They don't have the money. And they get you to vote, get me to vote on the basis they're going to take care of the, like folks is waking up. Polls have recently shown folks are waking up. I say we come back to God. Thank you for that feeble expression of agreement. I say let's come back to God. Let's come back. This is what, this is what kingdom is. It's, it's his principles. It's his laws. It's his edicts. It's his way of doing things. And thank God for grace and mercy in this dispensation until we get it right. It's not what they feed in you. Because that sounds fair. But oftentimes fair is unrighteous. It's unrighteous. You want to be fair about that, but I've been here 70 years and plenty of you ain't been fair about it. So I said, I'm going to read this last scripture, but before I do, help me, Margo. Help me, you wisdom people. Because I just, I want to ask a few people in Washington, in the state house. Some people are, 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 are very tender around that. But when I start talking about this, I feel fire in my belly like Jeremiah. Fire. I just want to know, I don't want cameras. I just want you to tell me who you are. Because I know what y'all selling. I know what you're offering. But I'm not sure it should be that way. So could you please identify yourself? See, I want to know, are you Jezebel? Or are you Esther? Because the place is on fire. Are you Ahab? Or are you Daniel? I'm talking about this template of prophetic messaging, not just to the church, 
but to the secular society into which we find ourselves. It's not by accident. Don't lose heart. God is moving. He is on the side of the righteous. You say, he's on the side of the oppressed. Not if the oppressed ain't righteous. The oppressed trying to be in charge so they can oppress the oppressor even worse. You see what I mean? You don't want reparations. You want revenge. And there may be an argument for that. Hey, let's make it right and let's make up for all that. But the, the way you grit your teeth and the way you bear your things and that mess, I'm telling you right now, has crept into the house of the Lord from the pulpit. Although, in fact, the pulpit is leading. The I want to go into a message about what aboutism. You say, what about justice? Well, we need justice. My question to you is, what about righteousness? The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's how you can be in prison and have joy. Oh, glory to God. That's how you can work on your job, knowing that the slings and arrows are coming your way, but righteousness produces peace, and that brings joy in the Holy Ghost. That's how you know what's greater. What's greater? Your joy is greater than your circumstance. Your joy is greater than racism. Your joy is, 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 is greater than structural unfairness. Your joy is greater. Tell yourself, my joy is greater than that. And whatever that is, just say, my joy is greater than my history. My joy is greater than my abuse. My joy is greater than my trauma. Somebody, you better holler if you got to run down to this altar and say, my joy is greater than my sickness. My joy is greater than my enemies. My joy is greater than everything that Satan's hell can bring against me. I am more than a conqueror. I'm more than a winner. I'm more, more, more because of Jesus Christ who died for me. My life has value. I'm making a difference. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Verse 2, this wasn't the verse, but I'm just going to quit. Wednesday night, maybe? We had an awesome time last Wednesday night. Praise you, sir. And, you know, let me just tell you about Wednesday night. I'm not trying to plug it, but, you know, people, people busy, they got stuff to do. But Wednesday night has always been unique for me uh, in 20 years. Because it's a little more, it's a little more intimate. Would you say? How many of you come Wednesday night? You say that, right? It's a little more intimate. It's a little more detailed. And sometimes we can actually go a little deeper. Because believe it or not, a lot of what I'm sharing with you today is just surface. So, here's here's how we end this particular segment of this template, this pattern of prophetic messaging to the church first, and then to others. First one says, now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. Oded, his name means encouragement. So here's what encouragement produced. Oded, encouragement, produced Azariah. And Azariah means helped by God. So God sends help to King Asa. Verse 2, and he went out to meet Asa and said to him, hear me, Asa. This is prophetic. He's a prophet. Hear me, Asa, and all Judah, that's one tribe, and Benjamin. Why ain't he talking to everybody? Because it has to start somewhere. Judah means what? Everybody know that. Everybody think they in the tribe of Judah. This message helped me to know I may not be in Judah even though I can offer up a praise. Right? That's for every believer. And then on Wednesday night, we said, what is the significance of Benjamin? Benjamin's name means son of the right hand, but he was left-handed. And if you do research, you'll find that in Benjamin, there were those people that could shoot a sling. It says that they could shoot a hair, um, a hair off a shelf at however many paces with either hand. So it's true, and um, left-handed people know this, 
they are able to use as a left hand, they can use their right hand better than right-handed people can use their left hand. Does that make sense? So whatever that means, God says, I'm going to use the left-handed folks. Judah prays, and I'm going to use the left hand. We could speculate, but here's what dropped in my spirit. Left hand means unorthodox. Take this with you. God is going to begin to do things in your life, my life, and in our collective life, the the life of whoever wants to come to God in an unorthodox or unusual way. We talked about it, Kenny, the other night. The left-handed people seem like they're cursed. I remember in school, they would try to get all the desks were oriented right-handed. Some of us you know, we have weapons, and so the weapons are all oriented white, right-handed. They eject the casing off into your face if you're left-handed, right? But in the right hand, it goes this way. Your clothes, the way you put them on, is more difficulty being a left-handed person. But in this instance, God says, I need somebody out of the ordinary. I need somebody built just a little bit different. And I don't know how many left-handed people... But if you're not left-handed, maybe you can just be left brain. Because God is going to do something unorthodox. Whenever God wants to change a nation or change a generation, he does something unorthodox. He makes Abraham leave and go to a new place. All right? Something's different about this next move of God. What's left for us today? I'm just going to throw it out there. If it tags you in the heart, then you respond accordingly. First of all, I know it's been a blessing to you. That's why I ain't asked you about it. God, see after every message, God, what should I be doing in hearing this message? What are you, what are you saying to me, right? To me first, and then to my family, then to my neighborhood, and then maybe to my nation. I have sense enough to know I don't need to try to save the nation if hell is in my house. I need to look around, sweep around my own before I try to take charge over the neighborhood. And yet there's grace. What do I do? I'm going to say the first, I start to say repent, change your mind. But I'm going to say this, just allow me these few minutes. I'm going to say obey. We don't like that word because the connotation is somebody's up over me. Your boss might not say, Trina, I need you to go do that. Snap their fingers. Some bosses do. We just pray for them. Hey, go. Are they authorized to do that? I want to know. Can they tell you to do that? Can they tell you that way? Yeah. Yeah. Should they tell you that way? Would you tell them that way? But if you're a wise servant of the Lord, you just do it. Maybe we'll have an opportunity later to correct this situation. They may even know by way of a test, they try to find out what ticked you off. So when you go like right away and you look like a chump, in front of your co-workers, my question is, is God honored by that? Oh, man, I'm in somebody's neighborhood. You, you've been wondering why it's not working. It's because we haven't been obeying. You figure you big enough, bad enough, told them people that want me to identify my blackness, I said, listen, I was here going to school, elementary school, before civil rights was even passed. I'll be doggone if I'm going to let you tell me what that means. I was a black, only black kid in my class most everywhere I went, and I didn't somehow come away with this monstrous structural racism about everything. Maybe I'm asleep, but what I know is that is not the kingdom that I represent. And I'm here to make a difference. 
Whether you agree or not, I don't care. I just want you to think about it. Think about where the house of God has gone to because we're trying to heap these preachers, preachers that can give us a sweet pill of emotion. And they can pre- man, this guy I'm talking about in Virginia, man, this dude could preach the paint off the wall, hoop, holler, squall, all that. I'm like, God, I wish I could do that. He said, that ain't your assignment. If you need that, find that. Why torture ourselves with each other? If you need that, just find that and be faithful. God will bless you. God will bless that house. But don't put me in misery just because you are. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he's anointed me to preach this message to those that are captive. He says, obey. Because if you're not going to obey, why are you going to repent? If you're not going to obey, why are you going to cry? Help me, Lord! No, obey me. <laughs> why? Because 1 Samuel 15, 2, the prophet tells the wicked, disobedient king, he said, you can bring all the oxes, everything out here you want to obey God. It's better than any deal you think you can make. To obey God is better than any sacrifice, any offering, any agreement. To obey God. Psalm says, I will trust and obey because there's no other way. Obey because Isaiah 1, 19 says, if you be willing and obedient. Not willing or obedient. If you're not willing, you won't really be obedient. You can have visual obedience, but you won't have obedience from the heart. You must be willing and obedient. And it says, you shall eat the good of the land. Verse 20, I'm prophesying conditionally. He says, if you do it, it's good. But, verse 20, if you refuse, and rebel, you'll be destroyed by the sword. I'm so glad y'all came. I hope, I hope I I can get another service out of you. I'm telling you, this, listen, this generation doesn't want to hear this message, but I've had my last time not obeying. I'm not, had my last time. You make your kids obey. But when the prophet of God, the man of God, the people that are in in authority, not autocratic rule and domination, dominion, intimidation, manipulation, I ain't hearing that. And so the judgments continue. Your God trouble doesn't go away because you don't realize God's speaking to you. Last one, Job 36, verse 11 and 12. It says, if you will obey and serve him, then you'll spend your days in prosperity and your years in pleasure. It's not about your gifts. They don't wreck. No, obey and serve. Your days will be prosperous and your years will have no lack according to the prophetic word of God. Verse 12. But... If they obey not, they shall perish with the sword and die without remedy. The choice is yours. I want to obey. Do you know that song, Brumble? Can you play it? If I could sing, I'd be tempted to sing, Shall We Gather at the River? But you know, the river's never been a problem. Shall we gather at the altar? Really? Oh, I need him. I need him now more than ever. Because all the voices, all the confusion, all the hatred, all the pick and choose and side, all the nastiness, all the dismissiveness. How do you have the love of God? I want to invite you 
to be broken today. Broken just to show up. Broken to do something different. People have asked me, why y'all still walk down front? Because some people need it. You want to keep your cool, not be known. Just know this, Jesus says, are you ashamed of me? Because if you're ashamed of me, trust, I'll be ashamed of you. But if you're not ashamed, I'll be, I'll be with you.